all of recorded human history, the Arctic has been nothing more than a vast frozen desert, left untouched by all except a handful of explorers, a few indigenous communities, and, well, polar bears. But in the ever-warming 21st century, this frosty expanse might just become the next major battleground where world powers clash for strategic and material dominance. The melting of the ice is opening up massive new frontiers, so in this episode, we're going to do a bit of Arctic exploration of our own. First, we'll take a look at all the High North has to offer, and see exactly why the region is quickly becoming a top priority for many of the world's governments. Then we'll see who the major players are, and exactly where they're positioning themselves on this icy chessboard. And finally, we'll examine whether we could have a really cold war on our hands in the next few years. Why exactly is the Arctic so important? Number one, resources. The numbers vary slightly depending on who you ask, but scientists from all the Arctic nations largely agree that there are about 90 billion barrels of oil and about 40 billion barrels of natural gas beneath the Arctic's frosty exterior. That's like 15% to 30% respectively of the world's undiscovered reserves. Now this alone would probably make the prospect of exploiting the High North too lucrative to ignore for most powers. But when there's so much oil still available in much more accessible locations, why go to all the trouble to invest in developing polar infrastructure and logistics? Also, it's really fucking cold there. Well, that's because alongside all those fossil fuels, the ice also conceals copious reserves of key minerals and rare earth metals. These materials are essential for the construction and development of new technologies for which the demand is ever increasing. But right now, China enjoys near total domination over the mining, processing, refining and exporting of these compounds. So securing access to these Arctic reserves is a tantalizing prospect for countries the world over to break their reliance on Beijing. Number two, renewables. Beyond fossil fuels and rare earth minerals, the Arctic's renewable energy potential could also be a game changer. Countries like Iceland and Finland already rely on wind, hydro and geothermal power for much of their energy, with the raging seas and the icy plateaus providing an ideal canvas on which to layer solar panels, wind and marine turbines. Number three, shipping and trade. The melting of the ice caps means slowly but surely, new trading routes will become accessible for more of the year. Not only could these routes dramatically cut down on fuel consumption and transit times, but they could also offer a way to circumvent traditional routes that are closely monitored and controlled by major powers. Now, as the ice continues to recede, more ships with reinforced hulls will be able to traverse regions that have historically been inaccessible, or at the very least, the reserve of dedicated icebreakers. For all of these reasons and more, several countries are already jockeying for position in the Arctic, trying to get a leg up on the competition. So who are the major players? and who's winning in the race. As you'd expect, some countries are a bit ahead of others when it comes to Arctic exploration. There are eight Arctic nations, Russia, the US, Canada, Norway, Finland, Sweden, Iceland, and Denmark. But Russia is undoubtedly in first place. Now, this is partially down to the simple fact that pretty much all of Russia's northern coast sits within the Arctic Circle. That's about 25,000 kilometers of coastline, providing the Russians with unparalleled access to Arctic territory and the historical incentive to explore it. But the Arctic is also of extreme importance to the Kremlin. In his end of year press conference, Putin said that the Arctic has a special strategic significance, describing it as a region with enormous economic opportunities and an indisputable priority. The key to Moscow's mastery of navigation in the high north lies in their fleet of icebreakers, which is the world's largest and most advanced by far. Russia boasts dozens of these incredible machines, including several nuclear-powered variants. By comparison, the US only has two icebreakers, even though most of northern Alaska sits in the Arctic Circle. Now, these incredible Russian craft can forge paths for research excursions and commercial shipping, one of the other key drivers of Russia's Arctic power play. The Northern Sea Route, the NSR, is one of three main Arctic shipping routes, and the only one currently accessible for large parts of the year. The route runs along Russia's Arctic coastline and therefore falls within Russia's exclusive economic zone, the EEZ, meaning Putin and his merry men 
can take charge of navigation and resource exploitation there, and also charge a hefty fee to foreign vessels looking for passage. But perhaps more importantly, the NSR offers Putin a way to ship Russian energy out east to China, India and other buyers with no interference from US or Europe. That brings us on to Russia's militarization of the Arctic, which has long been a key strategic theater for the Federation's armed forces. The Kremlin's nuclear arsenal is embedded within the Northern Fleet, whose headquarters are in the Arctic Circle. But since 2014, Moscow has embarked on a consolidated leveling up of its military capabilities, and the Arctic was one of the main regions of focus. In recent years, Russia has renovated dozens of Soviet-era naval bases, radar stations, and constructed more cargo ports. It's also built new airfields, expanded existing ones, and prepared sites for test firing of nuclear-capable ballistic missiles. Meanwhile, Alaska, Norway, Canada and Finland have all reported suffering a spate of what they think were Russian cyber attacks in recent years. But Russia is by no means the only player in the Arctic trying to carve out their slice of the pie. China, despite having no territorial claim in the Arctic whatsoever, has decided it is a near-Arctic state and has both the means and motivation to rival any and all players in the race for resources and strategic dominance. Now, its technological and naval capabilities mean China must be considered a real player in the Arctic, with scientists having conducted decades of research on permafrost in China's northern regions. Like Russia, China has also bought up real estate in Arctic nations, and also maintains a series of satellite bases and antenna arrays. They say it's for research purposes, but they more than likely have dual military use. But the main driving force behind this contentious push for power in the North is Beijing's desire for favourable trade routes. Now, despite being the world's largest manufacturer and exporter, a huge quantity of China's trade goes through a very small number of key choke points in and out of the Asia Pacific, and all of them are pretty much dominated by the US and her allies. So securing access to Arctic shipping routes will help Beijing to shore up one of its key vulnerabilities, as tensions with America and its Western allies continue to climb. Now, the question remains, Will the Arctic become a theater for conflict, or can Arctic nations find some common ground? There is no real conflict in the High North, yet. Despite relations between East and West being at their lowest ebb in decades, Arctic cooperation has continued, albeit at a reduced level, even as the war in Ukraine continues on. But the days of cooperation in the Arctic seem limited, as the ice continues to melt, and the prospect of capitalizing on what it has to offer becomes more tangible. Before this happens though, there may still be opportunities for the Arctic nations to work together, and for Western aligned countries to counterbalance Russia's dominance and the rise of China. Now that Finland and Sweden have been accepted, seven of the eight Arctic nations are now fully fledged members of NATO. Now this could greatly enhance the Arctic Council's ability to formulate a security approach to tackle Russian technological and military dominance in the Arctic, and make up for any one country's shortcomings. And although China has been at the front of the queue, buying up Russian oil and gas hand over fist since Europe turned away from Putin's supply after the invasion of Ukraine, the Kremlin is unlikely to want to cozy up too close to Beijing when it comes to Arctic development. Both Russia and China want the resources and control of trade routes for themselves, but according to international law, all the territory outside of the EEZs of each Arctic nation is classed as international waters, or high seas. That means a lot of the Arctic is basically a free-for-all for navigation, fishing, shipping, and resource hunting, with no one country having any more rights than the other. Right now, this doesn't pose too much of a problem, but in the future, huge swathes of the Arctic would be subject to rampant exploitation, basically by whoever can get there first. If the Arctic Council can come together to set some ground rules and establish a stronger set of governance structures to sort out any future disputes, this could go a long way to ensuring long-term cooperation. The problem is, the Council itself doesn't have any regulatory or legal powers to enforce these rules, but it could certainly advocate for them in international forums that do. In other words, as things stand, there is a pretty high likelihood that in the next few years, the Arctic could really become a source of major contention and somewhat of a battleground between major powers. We just have to hope that the Arctic Council and the existing cooperation that persists in the Arctic 
is enough to put in place some rules and some regulations to make sure that we can monitor this conflict and prevent it from spiraling out of control. Now, if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching the whole video. If you have any interests, uh, any particular subjects that you would like me to cover, please drop me a DM or comment below and I'll make sure that I put those in the pipeline for your viewing pleasure. Thank you so much as always and see you next time.